It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Mr. Elliot Haynes of United Nations World. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Sir Gladwin Jebb, United Kingdom delegate to the United Nations. Sir Gladwin, you'll recall that uh, the issue of Korea was a vital one in our presidential election, and it remains perhaps the one issue that most Americans are concerned with. And I wonder tonight, sir, if you could tell our viewers whether any constructive action toward peace seems possible now in the UN. Well, uh, Korea is not only a matter which uh, <coughs> Americans are deeply concerned with, but uh, with which my countrymen are deeply concerned with too. We've got, as you know, a powerful Commonwealth division fighting there. We've done <coughs> an air and uh, considerable air contingent and uh, some ships and so on. And we think in view of our commitments all over the world, we're doing what we can, what we possibly can. Let's well, Gladwin, uh, uh, do the British believe that the United, uh, uh, the United uh, Nations can take further action in the Korean matter, which might help uh, a settlement? Well, I, I think uh, they can. <coughs> what I think the United Nations has done already is to show that aggression doesn't pay. And that is a thing of pr profound significance, to show that aggression doesn't pay. Collectively, we have pushed these people back and got them uh, beyond where they started from, and that is a great victory in itself. Well, in now, now we've got to try and, and uh, stop the war if we can, but we can only stop it on honorable terms, and that's what the present uh, business is about. How to get an armistice, that's the main thing. Well, would you say that the United Nations had uh, proven that aggression doesn't pay? Yes, of course, it has. Principally the Americans, but also us and the other nations who uh, joined with us in repelling the aggression. Of course it has. Well, this, uh, this present session of the United Nations has anything been accomplished toward uh, ending the Korean War? Well, the session is a continuation of the session which started last um, October. And there, as you know, they, uh, it did do something in that direction uh, because uh, it examined the question of the armistice and how to get an armistice in honorable terms. And eventually the Indians proposed uh, uh, a solution of the prisoner of war question, the one outstanding question, which uh, eventually uh, no less than 54 nations, I think it was, thought was a good solution. Would you say, sir, that that, that clarification of the prisoner of war issue was probably the, the most constructive action that the UN has been able to take on the Korean issue? Well, apart from the, the fighting, yes, and apart from the fact that we contributed troops and all that, on the question of how to get an armistice, it did make a step forward. It registered the opinion of the vast majority of the world on what the principles for an honorable armistice were, and it laid them down. And that was a very important and vital thing to do. Well, are you now, uh, as far as the United Nations is concerned, uh, is the next move strictly up to the Russians? Have, has the West exhausted every move that we could make? No, it's not the Russians, technically, it's the Chinese. And well, I mean, the toward same the thing communist the bloc, no. yeah. Well, uh, you can call it a communist bloc, but the Chinese may have views of their own, I don't know. Perhaps they have. But, I mean, if something is done, it will have to be on the part of the Chinese. Uh, you don't know, is there any, any action that you know of that the West could take that hasn't been taken? No, I think we've done what we can. It's now for the Chinese and the Russians, the Soviet bloc, if you like to call them that, uh, to consider how, whether they will agree to an armistice in honorable terms, and they still may. Sir Gladwin, do you believe that uh, the settlement of the Korean problem is necessary before any other political uh, settlements could be possible in this Cold War, an easing of the Cold War? Um, well, in the Far East, certainly. I, I, agree, I, I think most uh, <coughs> certainly that uh, the first step is to get an armistice. Until you've got an armistice, you can't get ahead on any political settlement. Well, then you think that uh, the new Russian premier's statements about desiring peace must be proved first and uh, foremost in uh, Korea and in a Korean armistice. In the far as the Far East is concerned, I should say that's certainly true. Our people in this country, of course, have been interested in this personnel issue at the United Nations. The investigations more or less inspired by Senator McCarthy and uh, the efforts of Mr. Lee to uh, try to do something about it in the UN. Now, sir, and are you critical in any way of the way the Secretary General has handled this issue of, of uh, <laughs> communists among Americans who are in the UN? 
Well, we mustn't prejudice the, the debate on this matter, which is going to take place in the, in the assembly shortly, I don't quite know when, within the next fortnight or so. And there is going to be a debate on the whole uh, subject. And um, uh, <coughs> I think that um, one thing we must make clear is that the investigations by the, um, uh, the grand jury and the Senate sub subcommittee were not intended to be any attack on the United Nations as such. They said so, and I think that's absolutely true. And the, 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 there may be, may have been, uh, possibly, some Americans uh, who may have been regarded as subversive in the United Nations. If there were, the thing is to get them out. Nobody would dispute that. If they're proved, uh, in any way proved, to have been guilty of subversion against America, out they go. And Mr. Lee agrees with that, and I think he's doing his best to do that, and he has done it, if there are any. Do you think that the attacks, or Gladwin, uh, the investigations, rather, of the Americans in the Secretariat have done damage to the UN's prestige in this country or elsewhere? Well, I, I just say that there, as a result of all this, there was a certain um, a shaking of some people's faith in the United Nations, but I think wrongly, because after all, there are, there are 3,000 members of the Secretariat, and I don't know how many Americans, 2,000, something like that, of which only about 19 or 18 ever came under suspicion at all. Well, sir, has there been any comparable interest in Great Britain about its own personnel in the United Nations? What do you mean by that? Well, has, has there been any movement in Great Britain to examine the British personnel in the United Nations to see whether they were communist or not, or subversive or not? Well, uh, if there were any who were, could be proved to be guilty of subversion, we should certainly take the view that they should go out. Uh, Mr. Gladwin, <laughs> um, a number of uh, the UN people that I've talked with have suggested that if were U the UN headquarters outside this country, the World Organization might function with less pressure on it and a little <laughs> more ably. Well, that's a great question. That was debated in 1945-46, you know, before the decision to come here was taken. And um, I don't know, you can argue both ways on that in a sense, but um, I think one great uh, advantage of having it here, if I may say so, frankly, is that it has brought home to the American people what the realities of the world situation are, which they might not have appreciated otherwise. In a way, this whole business of the United Nations is a sort of microcosm of reality. It's what actually happens in the world, and you can see it here. Maybe you may not like it, but... It uh, <laughs> brings home <laughs> Russian intransigence. Yes, indeed, yes, <laughs> and it's a very important thing. And we can use this as a forum for our propaganda, too. Well, one of the things that everyone is looking for, I'm sure you'll agree, is we're looking to see if there's any change in the Russians uh, after Stalin's death. Now, sir, as a man who has had long experience uh, working with the Russians, have you noted any change in any of the Russian diplomats? after Stalin's death, or since Stalin's death? Well, it's really is too early to say, I think. You can't tell. It may be. I, I hope so, but um, I, I don't know. So let's trust to it. Maybe. I don't know. It's true, isn't it, that uh, the personal reactions of uh, the Russian delegates to you and vice versa have very little meaning in the political sphere? Oh, I do think we must keep up personal relationships. I mean, uh, treat them as human beings. Uh, 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 certainly, uh, uh, they said not to. There's been some criticism in this country, Sir Gladwin, <coughs> of what we call the economic interest in, in the United Nations. Many Americans feel that uh, the United Nations was created essentially as a political body. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, are, we, we note that the United Nations wants us to spend more and more money on, on economic interest. Do you feel, sir, that the economic interests of the UN are being overly emphasized? No, I wouldn't say so. I think that the amount spent on, uh, on uh, technical assistance is very small in relation to anything else at the moment. I think it's perfectly right and proper <coughs> that you should spend something in the United Nations on technical assistance in order to get to facilitate, the, was I think, the inevitable process of the industrialization of the non-industrialized areas of the world. It's going to happen. The question is, how can it happen best? You I think, think that it's proper for the United Nations as an agency uh, to encourage industrialization in the rest of the world? encourage it, but uh, to facilitate it and make it uh, come about in the best possible way. Yes, I do, and I think I'm doing great work in that way. There have been some movements uh, in the UN to have the United Nations itself invest in productive facilities in various underdeveloped countries. What is the uh, British attitude on that? How do you mean invest? In well, the International Finance Corporation uh, actually placed funds uh, under UN auspices abroad. Well, I think that's desirable. I, I, I'm all in favor of it. But all this is, is fairly small. It's only just the beginning. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it certainly does tend 
uh, to counteract the appeal of communism, which might otherwise be very great in the non-industrial you, uh, you say it's small, and therefore the various nations individually have to be mainly responsible for helping underdeveloped countries yes, rather than the UN. Well, yes, of course, but they can, they can, the, 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 the United Nations can, can uh, coordinate this, and it is doing that. It, in some uh, our viewers well. understand, said Gladwin, that under our point four uh, program, our government is spending money uh, to aid the industrialization of, of the underdeveloped nations. Now, is, is there a counterpart to that effort in Britain? Are you, is, is your government no, also yes. spending money to... It undoubtedly is under the Colombo plan, quite a lot too, as much as we can afford and quite a deal. But all that is being coordinated. Our plan, and your point four, is being coordinated under the Technical Assistance Board. And, and, and do you regard, do you think that most of those efforts should be coordinated through the UN? I do. I think it's the best way to do it. Well, as a final question, Sir Gladman, in, in our country there has been a, a growing feeling of defeatism about the UN, and uh, you have been with it from the beginning. And I wonder how you feel personally, sir, about the future of the UN. Are you hopeful about it? Yes, sir, of course I'm hopeful in a sense. I wasn't so, I'm not so hopeful as I was in 1945-46. I did think then that um, there would be an essential base for the United Nations, which was, which would be, would have been rather, the uh, agreement on peace treaties for Germany and Japan agreed with the other side, if we like to call them that, with the Russians. And on that basis, you could have built up much more uh, greatly than you have been able to do, that is true. Even in, uh, in the absence of that, I'm convinced myself that the United Nations does fulfill a very great function. I it uh, provides a forum where these great questions between the East and the West can at least be discussed, and with a little bit of goodwill, perhaps on the other side, uh, further <coughs> agreements may be possible gradually. And I'm sure that if we are going to avoid a third world war, which, uh, God help us, I hope we shall, it is the only way is to maintain the United Nations well, in being. Well, thank you very much for being with us this evening, sir. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Elliot Haynes. Our distinguished guest was Sir Gladwin Jebb, United Kingdom Delegate to the United Nations. The traditional presentation gift to symbolize achievement, honor, or respect is a fine watch, and the fine watch of highest preference is Longines, the world's most honored watch. Now, among the finest watches in all the world, only Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories. The Longines watches, now at your authorized Longines Whitnor Jeweler Agency, represent 87 years of fine watchmaking experience. They're unmatched for superiority of construction, for beauty of appearance, for prestige and reputation. And yet do you know that you may buy and own or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, Distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longine and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longine Whitnor Watches. This Sunday, another great Jack Benny show on the CBS Television Network.